I think we have a couple of folks coming up. We, uh, Karen? Okay, fantastic. And Josh? Here he comes. Okay, excellent. So, uh, Kenneth, we just heard from, so I won't introduce him. Karen, I will. Oh, oh Sarah, sorry. Yes. No, yes, please. Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, I almost let you off the hook. Um, so, uh, Sarah and Kenneth, you've just heard from uh, today. So, I, I won't introduce them necessarily, but uh, Karen, I'll attempt an introduction uh, of uh, a local, I believe. Basel and um, uh, uh, many many years history working in some of these um, making some of these speculative futures real wearables robotics voice interactions interactions starting back in 1996 so it's been a long long road <laughs> this is the year of speech sure <laughs> I've heard that about seven times over the past 20 years and uh, Josh Lovejoy a colleague of mine from Google um, has worked on uh, many of the projects that um, were showed by um, uh, Jeremiah very early on this morning, particularly Google Clips, uh, the small uh, robotic camera, uh, which I'm sure you might talk about a little bit in reference to what you're talking about. Now working a lot on uh, the pair initiative and um, issues of bias and fairness in learned systems and machine learning systems. Is that? Would you like to say anything more to introduce yourself? Or? Okay. Um, so um, first of all, I wanted to kind of um, uh, throw it to Karen and, and, and Josh a little bit, a little bit unfairly perhaps, but as people who have not been speaking today, but as people who have been in the audience, maybe just two minutes each on threads that you've sort of seen emerge through the day. I have notes of my own, but I'd love to hear what your reflections are on some of the talks you've heard today and what, what sort of resonated with, with you. Um, well, yeah, thanks for having me. And it's, um, I always love coming Coming to these, uh, you just pick up these nuggets that you don't expect to, you know, to be eye-opening. And and so um, I, I I think that a lot of the thread that even Alex kind of summed up is a lot of the design is in the writing. And we saw that with Simone, and we saw that. Um, but if it was just so easy to take a black box and explain how things got into the box, our job would be done. And it's it's not it's not that easy, because once you start describing or explaining with only a confidence of 43%, then somebody looks at that and says, well, that's shit. Like, why, why am I going to use that if it's 43% confident? And so how do we, so two, two, two big things. One is um, how do we get people to play along when the confidence is low? And um, we we're talking about this at lunch. Maybe it's like the eye doctor a little bit, like, is it better like this or is it better like this? Like, how, how do we get people to, to play along and participate? And I think a big thing that I haven't heard today, which which is always what I, a, a lot of what I try to design for is like, how do we know what we don't know? And, and how do we uh, explain that in a way of the things that we don't know? It's like the why and why not? Like, well, this is what I know, but this is what I don't know. And how do how do we design for that? Uh, yeah, a lot of yeah, voice is the future. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of threads. Um, a couple of things that spring to mind. Uh, one of them is just the fundamental need for more just dialectic dialectical discourse. So much today was about uh, inspecting and turning over and turning over again uh, from different perspectives. Um, and so I just think one of the aspects that I I really believe deeply in as a as a designer in this space is the need to kind of take a take a page out of um, kind of social systems thinking and especially perspective taking the process of coming to recognize the privilege that one has in any environment requires sort of stepping out of your own experience and stepping into the lived experience of others oftentimes there's just this huge disconnect between the work that we do as technologists and the actual impact directly on the human beings who are affected by it or consume it. Um, and in every instance, the ones who train it, which is like these totally anonymized people. Um, and the sort of the way that I'm other thread that I've seen today is a lot about the word perfect or accurate. Um, 
I bristle a little bit when I hear perfection or precision talked about because um, there's almost this underlying assumption that future states uh, can always be predicted based on past states. And the reality that everyone, I think, is pretty well aware of is that most often the past was not representative of the just, you know, uh, egalitarian future that we want. So because machine learning can't predict a future state that has no precedent, how do you build a prediction model that actually accounts for that complete lack of the asymptotic uh, sort of goal? So it's like unless there's something that you're like a state, a past historic state that you're comfortable with, persisting forever, then there's no such thing as perfect or, or accurate. So just like things to question. So the, the, the title of our panel, pan uh, the title of our panel, if I can pronounce it, is Opportunities and Challenges for the UX of AI. And, and one challenge that I think a thread that's come up for me through the, through the day and, you know, kind of sort of like um, put a nice hat on it at the end is kind of the challenge of people who are involved in um, uh, and the lady who just asked for a question as well, I think kind of like talked about this a little bit, is the challenge for people making product decisions to imagine or, 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 or concretize those decisions ahead of time at the appropriate scales. And I think one of the, one of the actually when Lucia was originally talking about this event, we were talking about scale and talking about the different scales that these things happen at and the, the scale of the hyper nudge system that Kev was talking about is something um, which you know we can all recognize that we're we're in now, but we can't sort of see the edges of it. We can't sort of concretize it. And I, I sort of um, I, I wanted each one of you to reflect perhaps on on that thread of of how do designers working in concert with engineers and product managers, etc., start to um, helpfully and in you know, time scales that work in terms of making products, start to sketch these scales and these scales of these dynamic systems for each other as well as the eventual, you know, end, you, I don't like using the term users, but the humans involved in, in each, of, each of these places in these systems. Uh, perhaps come back to Sarah um, on this one. Uh, so I can talk to you specifically what we do if, uh, so we went away for a retreat week uh, the other week to discuss what are the kinds of design we do? Could we give them names? And one of the things we came up with was uh, service diagrams, which might mean something very specific to you. But what we talk about is when we are designing anything, we try to think about how that service will fit in a wider system. So what else happens around that? Uh, an example might be if you're designing, say, a new ticket system for TFL, you then have to draw sort of TFL. And then outside of that, what does the law say about ticketing? And then you might have to draw um, maybe someone getting uh, cash out of, their, out of a local ATM. Or, I mean, it all depends on what the thing is you're trying to do, but it's about drawing all the other entities around that um, and especially thinking about uh, regulation thinking about um, also adversarial actors in that system too and what could go wrong. And I think that's a really, for us, is a really helpful way of thinking about different scales because it forces some of the discussions out from something that might be a very small interaction that you're discovering into something that speaks much more broadly about uh, what that decision means for other individuals and other institutions that are a part of that service in one way or another. So that's certainly a technique that we use. And I think it's, it's quite an easy one. <laughs> you should give it a go. Um, a couple things. One, uh, I like try to say that I think the burden of proof for whether or not something should be automatable at all uh, is on the level of agreement between people about what good looks like and how robust that agreement is to the diversity of the people involved and the diversity of the context of use. So it's just flipping the, the default assumption that automation is good to automation needs to be proven. Um, the second, and this is one that I, I recently read a definition uh, of disability by the World Health Organization, which describes it as being a mismatch between the features of an individual and the features of an environment. 
And I think talking about that, like we're all disabled, we all have disabilities. Um, there are some more persistent or more transient, um, but that as a starting space for innovation thinking, I think is just really profound. Very frequently we begin the innovation discussion around the like perfect alignments between people and environment. And we're like, oh sweet, we can send them a notification. Um, and so I just I just want to kind of as a provocation to, to the room, I think that that's a really kind of concrete place that uh, I like to nudge teams uh, at Google towards. Um, and then the, the third is just anything around this notion of augmentation. Um, the most frequent question I get asked by teams at Google is like, why doesn't anybody trust the recommendations that our, my system is building? Um, whether it's from like, here's a fitness program you should go on, or here's like a thing you should go do, or a flight you should take, or whatever. Um, and, and every one of them starts with, um, with again, this assumption that like, there's a great answer that can be vended. And so there's a little bit of a, we'll go back um, and uh, walk through the, walk, sort of walk in the shoes of the individual who um, prior to this point has been making these decisions confidently for themselves. They're you know, accountable to themselves and there's a sense of pride and craft and authorship. So in that spectrum of what it means to feel like you've made something, uh, there's a big space for like, you know, you can, you know, modify something and still feel like you made it. You can pick out from a selection and still feel like you made it. You can, you know, you can, you can actually handcraft things. But again, we jump, we tend to jump into this spot where you can like automate the perfect thing. And at that point, you've taken away authorship, you've taken away craft, you've taken away the personal expression. So how do you start in that bigger space? of a place where somebody feels like they can attach their own personal touch. That seems to resonate with what Kenneth was saying about, uh, about the, the veil of ignorance, John, the John Rawls conception, like being able to place yourself in a, an actor network rather than um, you know, being the designer of a user-centered design. And I think one of the threads that I was picking up on today is like, do we, do we, uh, do we come here to bury user-centered design? <laughs> Rather than praise it, um, oh. is is design is one of the opportunities and challenges of 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 the UX of AI is that there's no you there anymore. There shouldn't be. And and what I, I've heard through the presentations, this uh, kind of thread of thinking differently about you know or ditching the idea of a user. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on no, that. I'd like to I'd like to chip in on that. Um, Thomas Went is a designer in New York City. He gave a, a great presentation at Interaction 17. Um, I think it was called a critique of user-centered design, and he pointed out a, a couple of things, but one I'll, I'll focus on here. UCD has, for better or for worse, often for worse, focused relentlessly on individual success and individual productivity. And Went pointed out that uh, it hasn't taken into account the well-being of ecologies, communities, democracies, societies, et, et cetera. So I think that's certainly something we've lost, um, lost sight of with that um, UCD focus. UCD for me runs into some challenges when we are talking about uh, you know, devices that live with us, because the question then, as you point out, Matt, isn't really about how do we use these technologies, but how do we cohabit with them? How do we share an environment with them um, healthily? Um, I also, if, if I may, I'm just going to rewind to the previous question as well, because I have, I have a, a little thought about scale. Um, for me, scale is less about, or it's less useful to have processes. Processes, I think, don't scale as well as cultures. And so I'm more interested in bringing humans at the heart of this work through cultural work, um, and I'm also interested in looking at the default ideologies of the tech community because that really what is what sets our culture, which in turn begets process, et cetera. And I want to have a little, a minor rant about the predominant ideologies in tech right now, which are lean startup and the Californian ideology. A lean startup is a system that's predicated upon empiricism. The fact uh, is, is offered that we it's, it's futile to predict the future, therefore we should be uh, learning exclusively through empiricism, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. There's no space for ethical discourse within that system. There's no space for anticipation of potential harm within that system until it's done, which I think is something that has led us down the wrong path ethically. Uh, and the Californian ideology, I recognize I'm in Switzerland, but at Google, so there's an interesting conflict there. <laughs> um, if you haven't read the initial paper from 95, it's uh, Andy, Andy Cameron and Richard Barbrook, uh, kind of slightly weird. Um, but excellent piece about um, the 
uh, essentially the, the the political agendas of Silicon Valley. And it's still the case, and without getting overly political, I don't think it's necessarily a model that will help us become more ethical uh, and create better human-centered technologies in the next decade. So when I hear uh, London, Berlin, etc., saying, how do we capture some of that Silicon Valley spirit? My response is always, don't. We don't need more of it. We need something more local. We need something different to change the pattern, to change the trajectory that we're on. Um, so to this, to the scale question, um, I, I think as a designer who's like, you know, working on a day-to-day -day basis, um, before we get to scale, let, let's just kind of make better what we have today. And some of that is, I think, identifying the seams so we can we can make beautiful seams and we can we can show those seams. And so um, it's a lot about identifying every step of the way, kind of what what can go wrong, and that and that can be pretty tedious. Um, I think it goes back to, um, Sarah, what you were saying a bit about the service design and just Id identification of all the different flows and all the different ways that, that things can go. Um, Chris Nessel, um, who wrote Agentative Design and, and Make It So, he walked us through this uh, uh, futures wheel exercise, which um, has you put down kind of a prediction. And then from that prediction, you have like you write out direct consequences of that prediction and then for each direct consequence you you for each consequence you write other direct consequences of the consequences and then you link up indirect consequences and you're going to find the seams what happens when this indirect consequence and this indirect consequence happens together and you're like whoa that's kind of maybe where the future is going to go and we didn't even realize it so it's that's been a helpful tool so can i bring you back to Burying the U in UX and what your opinions of that might I'm, I'm you know, it just means I'll be in a job like correcting kind of stationary and lanyards and slide decks if we get to cross the U off, but um I don't know what to think about that. I know that I'm designing for somebody. I'm I'm designing for a need. I'm de I'm designing something that I want somebody to use that I hopefully in some cases will make their lives better. I was helping to design autonomous vehicles and um so everything that Dan was talking about, you know, bigger cities, better cities, there is an end. There's a my user is the reason I'm doing this. So I I have a hard time saying we've given up. Um it should maybe be expanded. Um cities, democracies, political agendas, things like that. But I, I, I can't let go of my user. Josh? Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, I, when, I, <laughs> when I hear arguments against user-centered design, often what I feel like I'm hearing are arguments against the, the current like optimization strategies that are way overblown in UCD, um, particularly things like engagement through clicks or time on task or you know uh, conversion um, and things like that um, and I, I, I kind of go back to your point kind of like the the um, I think the prevailing conventional wisdom is like get to market and then all else will follow kind of a thing um, and uh, I mean for the larger companies um, it's our responsibility to actually think I think in total polar opposite to that. Like you can't actually just say we're gonna push something out there and then hopefully more people will come to it and then we'll fix the problems as they arise. Rather you have to actually kind of do the due diligence up front um, and think about a broader spectrum of users. Um, the other aspect from a machine learning perspective is like if you actually want to build for uh, a robust system that's going to um, be iterative and 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 useful over time it's incumbent on you to look at a really broad spectrum and an intersection and an intersectional spectrum of user behavior. So you have to think about it from from like through to the end application of a technology. Therefore, have a user. It's just our traditional user is kind of played out, and it's not going to be useful in modeling the effectiveness of the system. Um, so I on on user centered design. Uh, I think that uses us the, the concept of an individual that you're designing for is still incredibly important. Um, and I have lots of views on how and why we should also think about larger groups of people. But something very specific about AI and user-centered design is as soon as you bring data into the, your 
design, which I think is really important actually, is how you think about scale, is also thinking about data flows as well. As you think about a kind of, uh, kind of user journey, what's the data that's being collected? How has it been collected? This idea of where ownership of that data might be, but really who has rights to see it is really important because um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I'm just going to go for it, um, which is that if we continue to design for an individual, but the data that we are fundamentally asking them to give consent for or to look at is has right. Uh, many people have rights over it. Like we can't design for that. So I think the concept of a user need breaks down when you realize the material stuff we're asking them or giving them permission to do something with isn't owned by them. At the moment, we have this really strong uh, story about I own my data. Well, actually, there's not much data that I do own, in fact, and I would encourage you all to look at the Open Data Institute's definition of kind of ownership on this, because in fact, data about me is also data about my sister or my mum or my dad. Data about me in this room is actually about all of us. So there really is that kind of collective right that we have. So I think possibly, um, and it's only something I've just thought about here, which is that the user need is a very difficult concept when we start <coughs> thinking about broader systems because, yeah, the material stuff we're working with isn't kind of owned by an individual. We have to think about this from the perspective of many. I guess coming back to something that Jess um, and Fernando were sort of like talking about as the, as the mission of Pear, your sponsor, um, is is that kind of making human, you know, human centered AI, the e human centered AI, the easiest option, um, and 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 some of that goes to the practitioners of this as well, and and so I think what I, my my sort of call, I guess, is that can we make it easier to incorporate in the day to day some of these kind of like multi actor, you know, networked collective ways of looking at kind of ways in which people are engaging with technology make that as easier as it's become through various uh you know scenes of training and technology and conference talks and tools and all the rest of it that we've had over the last 15 years as, as easy we've, as we've made or as rigid as we've made user-centered design in a way it's like is, is there a way to sort of build our way out of this in in ways that give you know very busy people the tools to do so easily I mean, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and, you know, people will make a good living over the next five to 10 years writing books about those, giving talks about it, doing training, and saying, here are some simple techniques that you can use to increase the, the view of stakeholders you have, if you like, broadening the views of stakeholders to include societies and populations and so on. Um, is that what we actually want, though? I mean, it may be what we want. Is that what we actually need? Do we want to make these techniques low in friction or do we want to actually do them justice maybe we need to push back from the idea that it has to be something that's subservient to the need to deliver quickly because maybe that's the problem maybe it's we found ourselves in this mess because we felt this deterministic pace of change this this sort of manifest destiny the technology has to go out there tomorrow um, maybe that's what's got us in this mess in the first place maybe we need to step back and address these issues in a frictionful way rather than a frictionless way. Yeah, I, would, I would kind of add to that, but it's kind of a, um, a pivot from the statement of making it the easiest uh, is um, understanding that once you've seen some direct harm that's been caused to a human being, it's impossible to look away from it. Um, and uh, through the work, the, you know, two, three years working on, on clips, trying to figure out what like an intelligence program looked like to me. As a designer, I realized that it was really uh, user research that was the fundamental like thing we've been doing all along that we need to come back to. Like a UX researcher, their primary job in the day-to-day -day comings and goings of product design is, um, is advocacy for human beings. Um, they are closest to them in the ideation phase and the research phase. They're closest to them in the evaluation phase. And it's this like person that we've delegated, this role that we've delegated to be the advocate. And they advocate to product managers, they advocate to engineers, they advocate to designers. And the most successful that a UX researcher can be is in influencing the decisions of others 
who get to shape the code or the metal that goes out to a human being. Um, everyone else is like an indirection layer away from, uh, farther away from that. And, and it's, it's striking that the majority of the training data that goes into machine learning models is super distant from actual user advocacy. The people who are closest to it are the ones that often don't have the closest access to understanding user need or human need. They have, it's not, it's distant from user research. Um, and there's no one advocating for the protocol design and the labeling process, the data collection process, the evaluation process. And so <laughs> there's a little like, to, to call back the practical, what can we do? with the how do we make it the easiest, I think we build on the existing systems we have with UX research and we expand that role to encompass data collection and protocol design and valuation so that we expand advocacy and we make it harder to turn away from the impact of the decisions that we make. Once you've seen that impact, the easiest thing to do is address the problem. Um, I really agree with what you're saying and I want to add that in certain areas that if has been working getting research though into the places where data is collected particularly say in a medical context is so difficult so it just means that you are in a situation where the products you want to ship haven't been fully tested because you couldn't um, and the data even if you do develop dummy data it's never going to be as rich as the real thing so there is actually a kind of I think also thinking about the kind of ethical procedure of how we can get in front of more people and have um, access to the right kinds of information is really important to make sure that we're making the right thing too. Um, so I to totally hear you. And I think uh, currently the kind of ethical frameworks we have around access to information about individuals to test products are necessarily and should be hard, right? But they're I don't think they align with the process of making right now. So it is very difficult to get to that point. Uh, yeah, just back to the um, friction point um, that, that, that was made, I think um, when I think, so when the original question was asked, um, I actually thought about it in, in the exact opposite. <laughs> I, I think what I heard is like, it's okay to maybe put in some friction in the process. Um, and then I just worry that we're gonna bias this towards people that are suckers for Fiction, like for for friction, meaning like they're they're willing to take more time out of uh, out of their day to, to do two more steps, or they're willing to look under the hood, and and then the people who who aren't, well, then I guess they're not going to be part like of this. Slow so, food is easy if you're rich and have lots yeah, of time. Yeah, right. So my first thought was, uh, you know, less work, more benefit. Like, show me how to. I, I can use this because it's so easy. It's like implicit data collection and, 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 but look at the benefit that I get. So, and once I've come along with that, once I've said, yeah, I understand all the benefits, I'm, I'm hooked. Then maybe you can introduce some of that friction. Jess, did you want to comment on? Yeah, you, you guys kind of got to my, my question. I actually wanted to revisit this, this point about, about friction and, and essentially the, the cost of it and who bears that cost. Um, because, I can see very, I can very much see a, a world where we have organic free range AI, which is uh, totally unbiased and comes and has been thought through all the way through and it comes to market later and you pay a premium for it. And the other stuff is essentially becomes a tax on the poor. Uh, so what, you know, there's a kind of a theory right now that like advertising is becoming a tax on the poor or people who can't basically pay for it to go away. And so we could get in a similar situation. On the other hand, you could also get into a place of, you know, who is this person that, that does the extra two steps each time? Well, one is it's the, the person who is rich and has the time on her hands. The other is that it's actually passed down the chain and those people will do it uh, to essentially, uh, you know, avoid some advertising or get a little bit more AI time or whatever it is uh, while, while the rich are essentially paying for their labor or their subsidized labor. So I just wanted to throw out that really happy topic to the group and see if... <laughs> Last week or the week before, I think the web turned 29. Um, and Tim Berners-Lee wrote an article in The Guardian. And I can't, the life of me, remember the exact phrasing of it. But a bit of it said that um, we're stuck in a place where we think that advertising is the only way to pay for digital services. And we need a little more creative thought. And I thought that was so good. Because <laughs> I really believe that. I really think there are other models. Um, so there's a big economics piece in there to uh, 
discuss. Just wanted to jump in there with that. Here it's, I hear it's good on panels to have disagreement, so I will disagree. <laughs> um, I think the advertising use case is, is blamed unfairly for uh, ethical violations, um, particularly by you know, certain sort of agitators and um, people who denigrate certain business models for the benefit of their alternative business models. Um, the truth is data is valuable to any business now. There's nothing exclusive about its advertising value. In fact, its value is increasingly centered on uh, its value as training data, as analytics data, analytics data, and so on. And the value to advertising is actually not that, not strictly relevant. I think what we're seeing is, and we can get very political here very quickly, but it's um, the natural outcomes of a system that has always essentially shafted certain people and rewarded certain people. I'm always skeptical of calls to abandon ad-funded models because ad-funded models have brought free transformative technologies to billions. And I wouldn't want to throw that away to see um, a system that uh, essentially makes technology a luxury good again. I just want to, um, oh. I, I have I, a question. Oh, you, you sponsored the thing, please. <laughs> <laughs> ask away. So I, I, um, I would love to um, ask a question about um, explainable AI. And, and I have a reason why. So, so I have both a question and I have a comment. So my question is, uh, for the entire panel, how useful do you think that explaining AI is? And I'll qualify that question. Um, so that's where the comment is. I think explainability is super useful for practitioners and for builders, because basically if you have explainability, you can debug your system. So I, that's a granted thing. But for end users, what I worry about is that um, I feel like in a room like this, I think there's an assumption that explainability for end users is super useful and it's a, it's a desirable thing. And I, 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 kind, I believe that. I, I come from a data visualization background and if I can visualize the heck of your data and show it to you as a mirror of yourself, I will be super happy. Because I'm like, you're gonna be more informed. You're gonna be making better decisions and I'm all for explainability. Then I came to Google. And I realized that end users, most of the time, do not care. And they look at transparency about their history of their data. And most, most users never look at that. And they don't care. And so my, my, my question comes from this, from this point of view. Is it, is it people like us who are assuming that end users actually want explainability? And if so, why do they want it? How is it useful? And how do we make them care, basically, at the end of the day? I'd like to, because of a thread I was going to pick up, I'd like to throw into that and see what happens. Was, was um, the, it was, a, it was a, 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 a quote from Patrick's talk, but also I think echoed through some of the things we heard this morning. Um, and Patrick said, uh, blurring the line between writing and using software. So again, we're back to this kind of the role of, you know, what role do we have? Are we end users or do we have authorship or agency? And does that change the demand for explicability, you know, explicability in these sorts of things? For plus five difficulty. Well, if I can, I, I don't want to hog the mic here. Um, I'm always worried when I hear things like, how do we make people care about something? That strikes me as a pretty loaded comment. No offense meant. Um, even if users don't care, uh, regulators will. And I think there comes a point at which it's simply good uh, AI hygiene to have explainability baked in or to have at least an approach to it within your systems. Even if it's something trivial like, you know, should I have chicken curry? Yes, no, yes. Okay, great. Tell me how. Um, we want to be sure that certain systems, essentially those systems that have a strong impact on human freedom, such as criminal justice algorithms, sentencing algorithms, and so on, um, those have to be explainable. And I don't buy any of the um, sort of hand waving and question dodging I hear sometimes from data scientists and machine learning specialists saying, ah, but deep learning, we're eight la layers deep, we just simply can't do it. You find a way, or oh, we no, don't use those systems. Oh no, and that's a very active area of research, right? Absolutely. So, absolutely. So, 
as I was saying, contextually speaking, I think there are scenarios and reasons why we want explainable AI, for sure. Criminal justice, for sure. But again, I, I think I think it's very dangerous for us as a community to be assuming certain things that users want these things. And so I, I would I would challenge us all to be thinking about creative ways in which these things can be actually useful to users instead of a, oh, you need to use you, you need to eat your broccoli today. It's gonna be good for you. So I, I'm I'm curious about are there creative ways or there as designers because I feel like that's one of the things that designers do so well is you engage with the messiness right we engage with the realities of the users and the user needs so I'm curious what user need are we actually talking about granted when things in machine learning go wrong if you get the wrong recommendation definitely you're going to want an explanation and I'm abs absolutely but 99% of the rest of the time, what, why, why do we need that? That's what I was gonna say. It was like, they don't care until they will care. And they're gonna care when, when something goes wrong. And um, to have that, to, to know, again, it's almost like knowing what you don't know. How are we gonna know when, we don't, when we're wrong? Um, and do we, do, do we just explain everything? But of course, you're going to want a different lens of when something is wrong, when something is right, of how you explain it. So it goes back to almost what I started saying before: how do we know when when we're wrong? How do we know what we don't what we don't know? Um, and may, maybe that's okay. Just knowing to explain it when things go wrong. I mean, like so many things in this area, that like well, depends what you mean by explainability. Um, <laughs> I, I, like throughout the process of trying to figure out the fairness question at Google and trying to figure out how to implement fairness into the into the life cycle into the launch process, um, it uh, always struck me as odd that the starting point for all this stuff was like to figure out some universal metric, right? But um, whereas in in like human day to day conversations, when we want to try to get an answer from somebody, it's kind of a ludicrous thing to ask somebody like, "Why did you do that?" Uh, it's especially ludicrous to ask a child, and yet I do it every single time my six-year-old like pushes my three-year-old or something. Like, why did you do that? Like, he's not, he's going to make up a reason is what's going to happen. Um, but, but what we do in the like more risk, uh, risky areas is we, is we perform some layer of calibration and, and accreditation, right? Like you have to take a test to drive a car. You have to pass a bar exam if you want to be a lawyer. Like, there's systems like to be a doctor. You can't just show up and think you have a good idea. You have to be certified. And so the the sort of interesting question I think we have as a community um, is to talk about what it means for something to be good enough, like a data set to be good enough or have enough uh, sort of quality or thoroughness or representativeness into it, so that we know like it's a credible source of data. Um, how would we then take that and to know that like the model has a is, is credible enough to operate within a given context? Um, so I think that there's yeah that 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 ability to track through from intent into application and to know that the um, the sources the year it was collected the people that were involved in collecting it the um, the underlying assumptions that went into the methodology of collecting it it's important for the people who are the makers. I think that's our first user to answer maybe one of your questions. Our first user that we, I think, need to hit, um, which is you know, why we focus on it with Pair, are the people who are shipping code, who have to look at it, who have to wear that iron ring, so to speak, uh, and make the decisions thoughtfully. If they can look at a data set and say, ah, yeah, that's representative of the intended application that I think I want to train my model for, then that's a life cycle that I think we can start out with. And with that comes explainability, I think, in a certain way. I think there are layers of users and I think that's kind of where we got to the previous question that that question of like what is the user need can be so harmful to a project it can also be really useful at the right time but it can also kill um work so I think it's it ha it should be used wisely as a question I think it's too readily uh I think it's used too widely actually um because I think that there are there are certainly user needs of explainability that are to do with when things go wrong, absolutely. And those go through lots and lots of different chains of whether that be um, individuals in an organization or at a parliamentary committee, or there's so many different levels of users that will need different kinds of explanations. 
But I think in general for, for sort of end users, so to speak, actually there's a lot to be said about the sort of folklore that we tell ourselves about the magic of technology and how things work and the sort of stories we end up telling ourselves because we just don't get it. Um, that will certainly continue, but I think we have a duty of care to try and help people get this stuff because there's a danger in that magic. And I just always think about um, individuals that I've watched who might be trying to help set up an iPhone for their um, elderly grandparent and the grand wanting to take a lot of care over that because you're making decisions on the behalf of someone else. And I think sometimes that's where you get to what the user need of explainability is. It's kind of so you can make the right decisions um, and so you can be in control of that. And I think that often when you talk about I don't care, well, think of all the times that you've helped your, your mum fix a piece of technology or even helped your, uh, you know, um, your daughter or son to make something work. You need to have a level of understanding and trust in that, that you can make decisions for other people. It's a really important part of being a human and, you know, building trust and relationships. So I think to forget that is to forget what it is to, yeah, what, what humanity is about, really. I know that goes really, really meta, but that's what I believe. So, yeah. Actually, just another echo from Patrick from your presentation. You, you talked about teaching as being this process of trying to uh, piece back together the process by which you attained the knowledge in the first place, but the other per the person you're trying to teach doesn't have the shared experiences, and therein lies the the magic and the and the messiness. To mm -hmm. to your point, just to editorialize. There's also the the explain the, the explanation is an invitation. It's an invitation to others to to make it better, even if it hasn't gone wrong. And I think that a place where the, the 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 refuge of magic as a metaphor for for technology design has i think that's to you know to the uh, the lady i think has gone but i think that's sort of where it went wrong <laughs> is uh you know i think we should consider magic harmful um like yeah, like yeah. go-to statements like it, it you know it's it's it, it is it, it's i think the explanation the ex the explanation is an invitation is, uh, I think, the thing that gives me hope for where we might take this stuff. Um, I think Dan had a comment and then I'll... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I knew what I was going to say when you asked the question, but, no, <laughs> but then Sarah said it's all about the essence of humanity now, so I'm, I'm lost. Um, no, is this... I wonder if, and this is a sort of a half-formed thought, that as you know, designers, that those of us that grew up with the internet, um, for a long time, user-centered design and things took root because we were dealing with a certain kind of thing as our output. You know, the first 15 years, 20 years of the internet or the web, which were, I say the web to be specific, um, we're dealing with a certain type of material, you know, sort of a media, it was music industry, it was search results, it was advertising systems related to that. And I suppose where a few of us have been going today is that now those systems are beginning to embed themselves in the fabric of everyday life, the really physical stuff. It's different, and it's different if it runs your energy system. It's different if it uh, affects whether the bus turns up or not. It's different whether you get into the housing co-op or, and it's beginning to, as we can see, understood that it actually maybe changes national politics, all kinds of things. And it wasn't that case some years ago. Maybe it was, but it was running under the radar. We weren't explicitly addressing that. So, so UCD and the techniques we have could for a long time get by with a very individualistic view because, you know, and, and just to be super clear, I once designed the Spice Girls website, you know, so that that's the kind of stuff that <laughs> the first 10, 15 years was about. I know, thank you. <laughs> turns out it was, uh, turns out that's incredibly important if you, apparently if you're for 14-year-old girls, but it's sort of, um, and more besides, but it, it it's now become, as it's embedded into everyday infrastructure, um, it's raised the bar in the type of design that we have to do. So this explainability question is now incredibly important, I think, because I can see why people weren't interested, particularly in the Google search data, for quite a long time. Um, but if it if it now affects these, the way that my life actually works in a very direct way, really fundamental things like whether food trucks turn up or not, then that's different. So it, it picks up your point, I think, Matt, also about this. Not just user-centered designs, but it's system-centered design or a civic-centered design in some way. You know, each of those wider systems has an impact well outside of that. So, the explainability of a bus stop is important, and that's why I put the planning notice up there as well. It's a really that piece of paper is a really ham-fisted attempt 
to explain that something is going to happen in your street. This is the decision-making process around it. Here's who's behind that, and here's who the arbiter of that, as in the local government. And here's where to go and talk to someone about it. So as, to, as Matt says, that's an invitation to get involved. We have to figure out what that is now for everything else. Um, I'm going to use the opportunity to thank everyone for sharing everything you shared this morning and this afternoon. Um, I wonder if we are blurring a lot of lines, um, because I don't think we are questioning uh, the value of explainability. I wonder if there are different layers of UCD. So is it that sometimes a regulator is our user or other times where the actual end consumer is our user? Um, and so, so, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that because I, I feel like uh, with a lot of the transparency, openness that we are asking for, we are also almost like um, pushing the responsibility of use to the user. And I don't think that is fair because the education levels of our community are just not uh, all in the same level. Until we do a lot of education reform, we are not at that level. So um, I don't think it's fair for a large um, amount of the population to um, ask people to be vigilant about these things. I don't want to get into a supermarket and feel afraid that the ceiling is going to drop on me, right? But there are laws and policies and liability rules that are protecting me. So is it that we are blurring the lines and we th should think about different layers of UCD and how, how to design for those different levels? Hello, I'm Rachel. I run a, um, I think, a tank in London called Dot Ev Everyone. Um, we just did a piece of research looking into people's um, uh, feelings and, at and attitudes about tech. And I think the really important thing that hasn't been touched on is I can feel 20 different th things at once. I can not care at all because I have to do it quickly and I can simultaneously um, morally and ethically care deeply and I think that that is, is glossed over and in terms of thinking about how we um, regulate and how we design f for um, regulators, there's a real issue around um, regulating for things that cannot be anticipated. So everybody knows a, a bridge is meant to uh, stay up. Um, the problem is in anticipating both the things that are likely to go wrong and that actually how can we understand people's reactions to, to uh, things if we're presuming they aren't interested and then it has to be easy. And I think the only th thing I'd, I'd add is that maybe not everybody has the time to have everything explained to them, but who is in the charge of, of choosing and that it, it isn't a company, it isn't an, a set of designers, there needs to be democratic accountability there which is likely to be different in different countries, unfortunately. A really um, good example of that, I just really want to say before it goes out of my head, because it will. Um, on this retreat, we were at, um, we were in Valencia for the Internet Freedom Festival, which is something that I try to go to every year. And it's quite a kind of heartbreaking event, actually, and it's sort of getting more and more dystopic every year I go. But this year, there was um, a talk that was about, um, um, abuse towards women in India and I think it might have been last year there were the horrific stories of women being attacked on buses um, and what happened at that period of time was there was suddenly a flood of apps onto various app stores for women to say where they were and that they were safe but many of those apps were not secure they were sending data directly to abusers and to groups of attackers now this is a real example of Leisha's um, 
comment about I go into a supermarket and trust that the roof won't fall down. Is it the Google's Play Store? Uh, is it their responsibility to have then banned those apps? How can regulation keep pace with the fact that in, within the space of 24 hours, there had been a flood of apps onto the market that then you know, women had downloaded and started to use. So there's a real question here about the sort of transparency and as I mentioned before, the kind of course correction and where can we help people to make better decisions? Because, you know, this is a, it's a, a really, I mean, a really hard issue to solve, but is super important because it's affecting individuals who are less privileged in a really serious way every day. So it definitely can't be us. I completely agree. Sure. Um, well, one just small note. Um, uh, interesting to note, and it's not perfect, but uh, of all of the different like fake news and weird sort of filter bubbly conversations, um, Wikipedia has been left pretty much intact. Um, it's an interesting case study to look at. Uh, I feel like at the risk of saying something I'm probably not supposed to say. Like I don't know that the the excuse of like 400 million hours of video is uploaded to YouTube like every hour or whatever like and so it's just there's too much to wrangle um, like I think we can probably do better than that um, than just saying there's too much um, so there's a question of like how how you actually take maybe some paid some pages out of the the leaning into dialogue and leaning into ways that people can actually do some self-regulation there's always going to be kind of a power dynamic or a power law of like not everyone is going to want to deeply introspect but there's a trust in like the fundamental good of a system that someone hopefully has thought about the structural integrity of a system. Um, and I think like it can't just be companies and it can't just be regula regulators and it can't always be the individual. Um, anyway, so just some food for thought. That work? Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, I just wanted to kind of build on some of those things that were said or, or to talk about a, a particular thing that I was interested to see what your reaction was. Um, I think um, we've all been talking about, you know, design and technology and progression and we're all kind of the developers of that and that is opportunistic and in the way that we create those opportunities, we become responsible for them. So it, it kind of fills in the in the discussions that have gone on the world. We are responsible as the developers and the and the creators. And uh, um, I think that what I was wanting to discuss was th th there seems to be a kind of time lapse issue where you've got the creators and the developers, uh, you know, people inside companies, it's not the companies are, but it's the people inside the companies are developing these opportunities. And then there's a kind of time lapse, and then there's other people. Uh, that then take up those opportunities that could be, you know, like, you know, uh, political opportunists, as we've seen last week. I think you were describing that it as a perverse distortion. Yes. So you've got that, which I think is a kind of in a time lag, is a second wave. And then you've got a kind of final wave, which is to do with legals and legislation, which is always at the, always behind. And uh, it was very interesting listening to Alex's talk about taking up the kind of position of trying to validate and certify the things that she was interested in as uh, in the first wave. So a kind of community of first wavers taking up, an, up a position of responsibility for things that they're creating. And I thought that was interesting. But, you know, uh, I'd like to just ask, what do you think about this time lag and how does it work? Because it's gone wrong, right? One quick uh, anecdote um, on the, on that. Uh, so there was an article recently in the Washington Post uh, after we uh, shipped Google Clips um, that was something to the effect of like Google hasn't built an all-seeing eye yet because uh, you got to have a clickbait title. Um, but the general provocation or the the conceit of the article was uh, to try to see if the camera was racist. Uh, like it was so um, everyone in our group was like high fiving each other, not because of the result of that, but because the article was written uh, because we designed that product so that that article could get written. Uh, it took a three or four year out view. We basically were like at the outset of, of thinking about how to design the product. 
um, we basically were tasked with collectively thinking about the worst possible applications of commoditizable surveillance technology and how it could be used uh, in particular to be harmful to people who are in uh, more sensitive places in life. Um, and I'll just say like one of the personas that we used to drive all of our ideation, um, there were many, but one of them was like, think through the individual who might be going through transition who has told some of their people in their life and not everyone else, how would you avoid unintentionally outing that individual? So like that's an example of some of the stuff that we thought about. That just stuff was pervasive. So as like the team grew from, you know, Jess was like the maybe the fifth or sixth person on the team, uh, as it grew to a couple hundred, every single person got that core question asked to them. Um, and it's not like there's a waterfall or a sort of snowball effect that goes into that. So that by the time three or four years rolled around, rolled around the answer was no, we hadn't built a racist camera. And it was just, it was the coolest like adversarial, like, yay, someone tried to break our thing because we wanted it. You know? Well, I was, I was just going to comment quickly. Um, Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachtabetcher wrote a book called Design for Real Life. Um, and one of the, the techniques they talk about there is the idea of a designated dissenter, which is sort of maybe slightly similar. It's this constructive antagonism. Uh, position within a team and that sounds like a great example I mean that you know the, the idea of this time lag I mean it's true it exists but it's still our problem like we still have to deal with it we're now getting a better understanding of how the trajectory of technology tends to evolve over four or five years of its life um, we recognize the limitations of just focusing on that initial early adopted use case um, but all of those consequences they're not necessarily directly anticipatable but they are within the realm of possibility and as such are something we should look at so the designated dissenter or questions like that um, for the clips product uh, goes some way to stepping in that direction I think and I'll just say there's been a couple articles I think even just past week about data scientists and designers working together and I think if we work together more we'll bring in those time lapses right I think it is understanding yeah, it, it is collaborative. It's a, it's a whole team working together to, to bring something to market. <laughs> there we go. So I've heard the R word thrown around a few times. Um, that's regulation um, in the context of the GDPR. But, um, you know, this is not going to be like the first you know, the first wave of the internet where aside from a little bit of legislation, intermediary liability, you could grow a nice big internet company and be left alone. Uh, regulators are gunning for AI, both in a positive and a negative sense, because of course, there's also a lot of positive change that has to happen. If you want self-driving cars, you have to change the road regulations, um, but because of the worries. And, um, and so the EU is going to come out with a big AI strategy next month, um, which will include them developing initially soft law, so voluntary guidelines for ethics sometime in the autumn. Uh, the Council of Europe, which also includes uh, Russia and Turkey and, God forbid, even Switzerland. Um, uh, well, that's, again, up to the same people who decided on Brexit because, you know, it's the European Court of Human Rights as a Council of Europe. So if, if they want to get out of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but so anyways, they're, they're going to be a bunch of kind of soft, they're also developing guidelines. There's an expert group that uh, has Luciano Floridi and Karen Young uh, in it that uh, will produce something by next year. Um, so there, you're going to start seeing these initially soft law guidelines, but they could become hard law on some of the ethical and human rights aspects of AI. I won't ask you all what those should look like because that's a whole different day of discussion, but from the and you know a lot of the ideas out there are there any really bad ideas out there like as you know in addition to all the good ideas that, that policymakers want to act on is there a do no harm principle where we should not touch something as policymakers um that you would sort of warn us off from like the um probably a lot i mean i can speak to that through the example of like the cookie law which was awful and then it's been made even worse uh, with the e-privacy law so uh i can i won't even try and explain the history of the cookie law but it was a, it's a bad design pattern right no one really reads it it's really annoying doesn't really help you understand the thing they're trying to tell you to do um but that then was written into policy that every website had to have a cookie notice 
So this really bad design pattern then became regulation across all websites and pretty much was like, a, oh, no, don't talk to me yet until you've clicked my thing and, you know, you've agreed that I can put these, this data onto your, these uh, cookies onto your laptop, this really weird interaction. Anyway, um, now um, we recognize that that cookie law should probably never have happened, but the emphasis has now been put on browsers. So as soon as you install a browser, you then have to um, kind of go through a whole cookie uh, kind of process of deciding on permissions up front there in browser. And that also isn't really solving the problem. It's just putting the problem elsewhere and making a whole load of other problems. So I think if there's one thing I could say is, is let's not do that anymore, as in like basically move the problem from one area to another. And then by doing so make even I mean, loads of other problems. Um, I could be really crass. I won't be. I think good policy is made by actually policymakers, um, legal teams, designers, developers, all coming together um, so that we can have a shared knowledge of what each other needs to do so we can help each other out. I really do think that um, policy is so linked to delivery. That's the way that good policy is made. So no more e-privacy laws or cookie banners, please. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, I am going to say, no, there's nothing you shouldn't touch. Um, you should have a look at everything. Nothing should be off the table. You have smart people, right? You've got people uh, from industry. You've got people from academia. I, I trust you to do the right thing. I would say don't, uh, don't necessarily assume that all the tech industry is anti-regulation or pro-self-regulation. Um, I wish I could remember the source. I'd have to look it up. 83% of people in the pu general public were in favor of increased regulation of the tech industry. That figure rose to 93% if you worked in the tech industry. I'm in the 93%. Um, I would just sort of maybe uh, ask for some nuance, maybe in certain areas uh, or a lot of areas. But one that comes to mind on this privacy notion is about how we can evaluate the effectiveness and usefulness of a machine learning model. So there's, um, there's like a wide gap there and, and it does come into having more practitioners in the conversation. Um, a machine learning model is only as, as good as its optimization approach. Um, and the way that you know how to figure out what that precision and recall measurement looks like is by having good, good ways to slice the results of the model. And the only way you can slice the results of the model is by having data sets that are intentionally over-representative of specific groups that need to be cared for. And to that question of how do we care for people and take care of one another, we need to know who we're taking care of. We have to have some notion of identity. And standard privacy leads us in a direction of anonymity and data blindness. That's the default. And we have to be conscientious about how we um, play with the, or deal with the considerations for people needing that right to be forgotten and that right to their privacy while also being able to understand how we're underperforming for groups that will, by definition, always be at the margins. We have time for a very last question. I, I was just, I was just going to say um, what we, sh building on that is, um, let's make sure who's ever steering and, and inputting to, to this process um, cover a lot of the diverse groups that, that we have, as well as making sure that design is, is part, part of that, right? Because I think we're designing this for people. And so very often it's, uh, it's not just the engineering who should be driving that. Thank you. Oh, hello. Oh, it does work. Sorry. Thank you so much for, uh, for all your helpful uh, comments. So, so this is just on the question of explanation and whether people want them or not. Um, so I think people can be owed things even if they don't want them. But the, the second thing is that um, with regards to whether people do want explanations, we might think that um, in some ways they, they don't understand the stakes yet and that the reason that they might not want information is because they believe that even if they have it, they don't have control, so they can't alter anything about their situation. And I was wondering if that might be a longer term aspiration of this community to move from explanation to designing products that actually give people meaningful control over their lives. Uh like, yes, I really love that. Everything about that comment, I think, was spot on. When we've done work looking at um, people's mental models of risk in medical information, um, whilst I know I can't use that quote because <laughs> it's from a research session. Uh, anyway, people's um, 
this is difficult talking about some of this stuff, right? Because you're like, oh, that thing, you can't say like that. Um, which was that um, people don't have a good idea of the risks at stake, I think, um, at all. And uh, so, th and that means it's, it's really hard to uh, help to, ex well, for people to care about explanations of it. So I think your point is spot on. Um, I, I think we also fall into this trap of trying to design like AI as some sort of universal affordance. Like um, you can just show up to a blank screen and then just like emote at it or something and it'll just like know what you want, um, which is crazy. Um, and uh, I had this experience this morning that made that, I, I, I like to sort of tie these things into like active decisions that I have to make. Um, I was just walking along the sidewalk and, uh, and uh, Lucia gave me the insight yesterday that kids walk themselves to school here. It's amazing. It's not at all how it happens in at, America. At six years old. It's, it's like unbelievable. Oh, so this like sort of pack of little kids came at me uh, <laughs> with, it wasn't a pack, it was like four, um, uh, on like little scooters. And, uh, and I was paralyzed because I was like, wait, which side of the road am I supposed to walk on? There was that moment where I was like, do I go past on the right or on the left? I'm in Europe. I don't know what to do. Um, and so uh, I realized at that moment I was walking up to this universal interface and I was dumbstruck. And so I just stood still and let the kids go past me. And I feel like very frequently when we design UX for these systems, we're expecting people to like just know how to use it. Um, we come up with skeuomorphism in UI design to deal with this. We come up with personality in, in conversation design to sort of try to give people a sense of what to say at it. Um, but more often than not, systems fail for people uh, or aren't thoughtful about human need. Um, and so the reference points that people bring to the table are like, well, this thing is probably going to fail, so I'm not going to try anything. So I think one of the things we can do is get more specific and design systems that aren't AI, but are just tools and products, and we use normal language. And to get back to the point about magic, I think um, that that we're it's a success state when we're talking about generative systems or adaptations or machine learning that um, helps facilitate a useful interaction and helps somebody just like be feel like self uh, like the self efficacy has been improved, not the trust in the system. So more precision in the targeting of the design, the use case is more focused, less about this like let the user try to figure it out. And then I think through that we can make them more tractable. Yep, and if we do that, just to build, build on that, um, if we also set the expectations of what the system can do, what it does really well, um, then it'll better set the expectations for the user and we'll have more successes instead of just uh, more failure because we've tried things that it really sh was never designed to do. Um, I agree with the sentiment that, yes, we should try and offer people control of these systems. Um, but realistically, not everyone will have control over their destinies within uh, social systems. So it, where possible, yeah, sure, we can try and challenge that. We can try and change that reality, that experience for that user. But I'm also wary of offering false hope. There are many things that exist outside of our direct control. Um, and I think explainability and not a shrug of the shoulders, but uh, you know, a definite sort of that's the way it's going to be, I'm afraid, mate, um, is sometimes going to be the solution as well. And on that. <laughs> uh, now we're going to talk about opportunities, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I, I would actually like to, I mean, be up, there is an opportunity for drinks and heavy appetizers <laughs> about to happen. Turns out heavy appetizers isn't a local Zurich punk band. <laughs> we've hired, it's, it's something we're going to eat. But in terms of opportunities, I, I, just to editorialize one thing, I think one thing that, uh, to your question, sir, uh, about you know, things to bear in mind, something that I like to bear in mind, or to, at least to keep myself sane, is um, one of the things that technology does is it changes the structure of things for, for, for good and for ill. And I think that um, we shouldn't approach um, the business models, the, the user framings, the ways we create products for the next 20 years in the, last, in the way that we have the last 20 years. We're gonna, we have new technologies coming down the pike, not just in terms of machine learning and learned systems, but also in terms of some of the fundamentals of computing, which are gonna change the topology of what we're doing. Um, and we can use that, we can judo flip that into societies we want, or we can shrug and deal with it in other ways. 
So I think you know, look, looking, modeling the future in 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 ways that don't necessarily reflect the language of the past is something that designers are quite good at. So yeah, invite us to some of your meetings. Thank you. Um, beer. Thank and you. Appetizers. Yes. Before we go there, uh, thank you to our panelists. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And. Thank you all for coming. I think this was a great opportunity to, uh, selfishly speaking, to empower uh, the UX community to be more intentional and aware and enticed to shape technology in a way that uh, we, in the way that we actually wanted to influence society. And I think as someone who is very deep on product, I really appreciated that. So thank you so much. This was great. Um, a huge thanks to Bun. Where is Bun? He, he was awesome. Thank you so much, uh, as usual. Um, thanks to the Zurich facilities and uh, our sponsors, both Pair, uh, as well as actually my org, which is a, a user experience team for all ads and payments and these ugly things. Uh, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, so, but this is really an, an intention to really kind of like create a discourse and empower designers and researchers to really think about uh, how we're shipping technologies in our product. And then last but